I think first and foremost, we should keep in mind what James Madison said. Yeah, we know what he talked about, the dangers of factionalism. But at the end of his writings, he said, the circulation of confidence, of trust, is more important than the circulation of money. And his explanation was, if we ever lose trust in public institutions or with each other, then we're lost. It is my privilege and honor to welcome to Ford former Navy Admiral and two-term member of Congress from the great state of Pennsylvania and also my fellow presidential candidate in the 2020 cycle, Joe Sestak. Welcome, Joe. Well, Andrew, it's, it's very fine to be back with you. Indeed, my friend. Uh, we have some stories to tell from the trail for sure, but your story is epic and fascinating. Uh, I first heard of you when you were in the throes of uh, various congressional and Senate races. I didn't know the full backstory, which we'll get into, but you spent 31 years in the U.S. Navy, including as a three-star admiral. So my first question is the question that everyone has, has for you, I'm sure. What did you think of Top Gun 1 and 2? <laughs> well, a lesson to take away from this one, Andrew, is Tom Cruise flew an F-14 in the first one. And the second one is aboard a joint strike fighter. But, you know, unlike what we do in America when we close down a coal mine and we go to uh, producing solar power panels, the middle class, the enlisted of that aircraft carrier, we didn't throw them out and say, you don't know how to work on this. We trained them for the next step. And so when I watched it, what was really missing in that movie and all I could think about was the 5,000 sailors on an aircraft carrier. Their average age, Andrew, 19 and a half. Oh, my gosh. And so that's what I think about. I know Tom Cruise gets all the glory, and well, he should. But as General Akramayev, when he came on over here, he was chief of the Soviet Union general staff. And Admiral Crow took him everywhere. Admiral Crow took him to a barbecue in Arkansas. <laughs> he took him to military bases. His last stop was aboard an aircraft carrier. And when they had left it and come back, he said, Admiral Crow asked General Akamea, what do you most get out of your entire time in America? What did you most appreciate? And he said, you're enlisted men. Now, it's men and women today. I know that. But that's what he said. And so to me, that's what built America great. And that's what made Tom Cruise so meaningful to me, two pictures so meaningful to me. I took a different take on it, but that's all I could think about is those men and women making sure that plane goes off and takes off from the catapult. And all the captain does is give him a salute, knowing that that youth of America, you could trust that he did his job right, that that plane would work. Well, you were in charge of how many uh, thousands of sailors? Well, there was about, uh, I think I had approximately 15,000 sailors, SEALs and Marines. And, uh, you know, in the evening, I'd always either go down to the mess decks to eat with them. Or I'd have six or seven of them, like both mates, up to eat with me because I had a nice little sea captain. And so you know, that's everybody. And that's the great thing about the military. They come from every state. Heavily, unfortunately, we don't get as many from up in the northeastern part or the, you know, along the northern part. Now, if you look at a demographic map of who comes in, it's more of a swath from Pennsylvania around. But you get them all, all races, everything. And, you know, even before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was out there, we all knew who was gay. And all I can remember when Don't Ask, Don't Tell came up, Somebody would come up and says, I got to tell you, Captain. Um, and I, all I could think about is, please, don't tell me. <laughs> but I don't want to lose you. But that's what you learn in, the, in this great global canvas of American service. I wore the cloth of our country for 31 years. And what I learned from there, that we do have more in common than in differences, is what I really still believe today. Well, your dad served in the Navy. You followed in his footsteps. You finished second year class at the U.S. Naval Academy. And so it begged the question to me, who the heck finished first? Like, what happened to that guy or gal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I got I got to uh, mention one other person though, my mom. You know, together as they said, they, they raised eight kids, but she also served our country. She Amen. served almost three decades as a high school math teacher because wow. I honestly believe education is our homeland defense, our real homeland defense. Yeah, your mom being a math teacher is is incredible, and you ended up uh, founding a nonprofit for STEM education. Uh, much later in your career. You're also a PhD yourself. How the heck does someone get a PhD from Harvard while being a, a Navy officer? Because I saw that and said, well, like, if anyone could do that, it's Joe. But, um, you know, it, it doesn't seem easy. Well, you know, we pre we value education so much in our service. When I was departing, you could not become a senior chief petty officer unless you had earned at least an associate's degree in college. You could not, you could not, even as I was entering, become a officer of a, a mid-grade lieutenant commander commander unless you had a master's degree. So when I graduated from the Naval Academy, they let a few of us go off to civilian institutions because it's good for us not just to have our own self-centered education system as we do out in Monterey Naval Postgraduate School. But I wanted to go to sea first and I want to be in engineering. <laughs> down there with the Boilermakers. And, and, and so I came back, applied to go to Harvard and got there. And I studied political economy and government. And that Navy, the Navy purposely sends a number of us around to various civilian schools for that. So that then later on, when you're sure, I mean, war fighting was my specialty skill. My subspecialty was strategy and policy and political analysis. So I got to, and went to work for General Colin Powell that's why I went to the National Security Council at the White House to work for President Clinton, so that you're able to balance where does the military fit in in this broad spectrum of U.S. interest. But above all, what it helps you do is understand militaries can stop a problem, Andrew. They cannot fix a problem. So before you decide that you are going to use our military, make sure you know how it's going to end before you think it's wise to begin. And I think looking in recent history, you will see that error was made. We didn't think that through. Well, you, you commanded thousands of sailors during uh, the Gulf War uh, and then served uh, as a National Security Council member uh, under the Clinton administration. You were, you were elevated to three-star admiral and then you were given a, a task around, hey, how do we ready the Navy for conflicts of the future. And, and here's where it seems like some some politics started entering the, the picture where you stood up and were like, hey, you know, one of the big threats is going to be cybersecurity. So we should really be investing resources in that, which, by the way, sounds eminently sensible. And you were ahead of your time because you were saying this in, in what year? This was 2005. Yeah, so in 2005, our friend Joe Sestak, the Admiral, is like, hey, guys, uh, we should probably be investing in cybersecurity. Um, which ended up being unpopular as an opinion then, um, because there were a lot of people that wanted more uh, traditional equipment and, and collateral and the rest of it. Uh, and, and so your incredibly distinguished career, you have 10 medals that I saw. Uh, you're a three-star admiral, and you're making a case for the future that I think now everyone sees it as completely accurate and prescient. Uh, but then what what happened next? Yes, I came back from the war first off. Uh, I'd gone on the ground initially because after I'd been in the Pentagon, walked out of it. A plane came in just after I walked out and I went walked back to go see the destruction. About two days later, the chief naval operations said, you're going to head up and set up a strategic and, and operational, to some degree, anti-terrorism. Took me onto the ground in Afghanistan for a short mission at the beginning of the war. Came out, commanded that aircraft carrier battle group as we struck. I came back. And the chief of naval operations said, Joe, you're going to be my black hat analyst. <laughs> I'm going to give you $10 million, which is decimal dust in the military, as you know, Andrew, yep. and 100 people. And anything that comes to me, he said, as a three or four star from a three or four star admiral, you as a two star at the time was going to analyze it. And I did. He said, I don't want your opinion. I don't want your opinion based upon the facts coming out of your analysis. So out of that, I proposed that the Navy, having war gamed it, because I had this wonderful young man who could see the future. And I love youth because they're not burdened with experience that I could stand there, listen to him. And then we war gamed it, went to NSA, other places that were just beginning to get in cyberspace warfare. And our argument was that 
the future domain of warfare is cyberspace. We should not, and I and have 375 ships, about 240, 250 is what we need because you need to carry some munitions to the fight. But if you are blind, deaf, then you are dumb. And so 17 out of 18 recent war games by RAND have shown that the United States gets it. And the words used by its analysts were ass handed to it because they break our networks that connects our brain to our nervous systems. But when we proposed that, it was not good. I'd become a three star. I was told to go brief the hill. We submitted to the hill. We're going to cut down on these ships and we want to put the money into the domain of cyber warfare. It's actually probably going to be less expensive and station aircraft carrying Guam, because, for example, if China were to, as you saw some recent indications of how unhappy they were with Speaker Pelosi's visits, they will do this unlike having watched how long Putin took to build up, how long we took to build up in Iraq, that we're going to come from San Diego at about 35, 30 knots, maybe 35 knots. They are going to go at the speed of nanoseconds because they will make everybody blind and deaf and immediately try to occupy that. So that is when I uh, chief naval operations left, the new chief naval operations, as is his right decided that, nope, we needed 375 ships. And yet today, the Defense Science Board came out two years ago and said, not one major weapon system in the U.S. military do we have confidence hasn't already been compromised. Because as you know, Bloomberg did a report a few years ago saying that even in the servers that Apple, Amazon, CIA drones they mentioned, as well as Aegis ships, had chips put in them that could awaken like a Soviet, old Soviet sleeper agent and do damage, or they weren't secure of, of, uh, of um, being able to go in and damage the software. And now, two years ago, the Secretary of the Navy has said, had a report done that said, the Navy is focused on 375 ship mindset. It doesn't understand the domain of warfare they have to protect against the cyber. I still believe that's a challenge today. I've written an article a year ago about this, and I just hope things change because at the end of the day, it is about the lives of our sailors. And that iron triangle, <laughs> Congress, you know, President Eisenhower talks about the military industrial complex. The rumor word is that he crossed out the word Congress in the last draft. It was a congressional military industrial complex that holds on to things much like the battleship and the carrier era warfare just before the real war began. And luckily, the carrier won, all, won over. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. We all have good days and bad days, days when we're set to be able to solve the problems in front of us, and then days when the problems seem really big and daunting. The question is, how do we stay in a positive problem-solving mode more frequently when it feels like the deck can be stacked against us. I first saw a therapist when I was a teenager and have been a huge believer ever since. My brother's a clinical psychologist. The fact is therapy is one of the best ways you can actually figure out how to solve the problems in your head. And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, entirely online. You can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can help get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com Yang today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash Yang. Well, you were referred to at the time by uh, the chief of naval operations as a patriot's patriot and a man of courage. Uh, you ended up leaving service, which I'm sure at that point uh, comprised the totality of your adult life and identity, move home to Pennsylvania, and then decide to run for Congress in a district that is written off as completely uncompetitive. Uh, I, I think you were down by 30 points to, to start, and no one thought it was a good idea. You reached out to the Democrats, uh, the DCCC, they thought it was a terrible idea. Um, and then you decided to, to, to get in anyway and somehow won that race. First of all, I asked a classmate of mine, we went to rival high schools off the Naval Academy, off to war in the same battle group together to run, my, to run with my brother, my staff. 
And yeah, it was a hard slog. You know, it wasn't just seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. We had to build the tunnel. And so what we did is worked hard. I mean, six a.m. <laughs> I was out there at every train station. And I'll never forget handing a brochure to everybody. And, you know, as they were there at the train station every morning. And because you can't fundraise between six and eight, as you know, Andrew. <laughs> so and I remember this young woman saying to me when she looked at it, I said, I'm a retired Navy admiral. And I'm running a national security that begins at home in health security because I want everyone to have what saved my daughter's life. And she looked at me and said, Admiral, you got to be kidding me, Democrat. <laughs> and so I got a lot of support from Republicans, though. That's how you swung a district that no one thought was competitive. That's right. And the morning after the election, Andrew, I called up uh, Charlie, who was the head of the Republican Party. He was an a uh, very uh, hard Marine <laughs> and said, Charlie, first call I made the next day, can I come over for a cup of coffee? I did. I knocked on the door. We went in and we still talk to one another. We talk every two, three days. The point is I learned in the Navy that the captain doesn't get off the bridge wing and go down to the boiler room and talk with them. Not just with those that are right next to helping them navigate the ship, you know, those top side, but also those down there, you know, sweating away and working. You're not going to make it. So we worked hard. And when you came into our office, uh, you weren't allowed to say the word Republican or Democrat. And we worked and went anywhere, any place, anything. And the result was, as you probably know, Andrew, I got reelected by 20 points and didn't spend a penny. <laughs> of the three and a half million that I had raised on an ad. And I think it goes back to what I learned in the Navy. People do want to trust. And if they trust, they're willing to listen and talk. And it doesn't mean they vote for you, but the anger, the misunderstanding isn't there. 10 healthcare town halls, I loved it because that's why I got into my country back for saving my daughter. We took what soon became known as Romney Care and had not passed yet. And that's what I ran on. And as I explained Obamacare, the Tea Party patriots were there at every one. I'd get there an hour before, shake all their hands, stay three and a half hours until they were walked out. And the last one, and I still tell you, it's my, one of my favorite photos, is they asked, the Delaware County Tea Party patriots asked for a photo with me. I mean, I really do believe we, if that, we can regain that trust in the democratic system, in someone who can help us understand like Abe Lincoln did, a house will fall if it's, you know, the divided will fall. I think that is what is most important. I think you said what I said on the presidential campaign, I was told. Mr. Trump, President Trump is not the problem. He was the symptom of a problem where people felt this, this process yes. was not accountable or fair to them. And if you don't look at it through their eyes, walking in their shoes, then you can't just keep lobbing back and forth artillery shells of single-minded cultural issues yes. and expect to bring this nation together again. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of walking uh, uh, in someone else's shoes, you walked across the state of Pennsylvania, yeah. I think in the next big campaign, which was a statewide U.S. Senate race. And here's where it gets weird, where you won your congressional election by 20 points. It's very clear to anyone saying that you have amazing bipartisan appeal because if a Republican here is retired Navy Admiral, 31 years of service, 10 medals, they're like, okay, I get it. <laughs> like this guy's as patriotic uh, as the day is long. But the Democrats, for whatever reason, really don't want you to run. And this is one thing I, I actually noticed this uh, even as a civilian contemporaneously. At the time, I was like, why the heck are Democrats not piling in behind Joe Sestak? And instead, they, they were behind an, another guy that you beat in the primary. I, uh, you're talking the second Senate race right now, I believe, correct? The first yeah. race, I beat Senator Specter, who had changed from being a Republican to being a Democrat. Now, that alone isn't what bothered me. It bothered me that our leadership could embrace someone who had actually tried to humiliate Anita Hill as the Democratic fellow senator stood by in the testimony she gave about sexual harassment by now Supreme Court Clarence Thomas. And I didn't agree with that. And so I ran against him, against the party's desires, beat him, 
been the year of the Tea Party, closely not. But that next race, I could tell from that year of the Tea Party that politics had changed. People no longer wanted to know who I was. Navy Admiral? Democrat? Are you kidding? They want, what do you stand for? What issues do you think about this? What do you bring from knowing about the world, having visited 80 countries in your career? No, they wanted to know if I knew what they had gone through in that great recession to where Democrats and Republicans, in the one place you should have a wall, they tore it down because a wall needs to be on Wall Street to keep (laughs) greed out and accountability in. And because they tore it down, it just collapsed our economy. And who got hurt? The carnage of millions of jobs and livelihoods. And they wanted to know, you know, as much as other things, who's accountable for this? Who can I trust that would ever say I was accountable, not just for the my intentions, but for the deed. So I decided to walk across the great state of Pennsylvania and halfway, th- and it was great. You know, I had two phone calls on the way across, uh, two special ones. One was from a Republican. As he was on phone call, he walked outside his car dealership and yelled out, because I had my flight jacket on, Admiral, I'm a Republican, but I love what you're doing. Every day was a town hall, talking to the media. Anybody could come, not just bust in from Democrats. The second call was from the Democratic leadership that controlled the money and said, stop walking. No. Yes. That's crazy. Stop walking <laughs> and just fundraise. So Pennsylvania is a very long state uh, lengthwise. Like how many miles is that and how the heck long would it take to walk across it? Yes, it took, I, I wish I, I wish I remember the facts, but they were, it was, I started in Philadelphia right on the river and uh, came all the way across. I think it was 28 days. I that think. That's about right. And yeah. I, I thought, I thought I would thought like four 20 weeks. miles a day and I'd stopped everywhere. I, I got to tell you, I, I love it. And again, my daughter uh, had given me a sign in my first race that I carried with me, Joe Sestak is walking in your shoes. And, uh, and I meant it. And even on the presidential race, I had that little sign up on my website. And I think that's what we have to do. You have to see it from the other guy's perspective. Doesn't mean you have to agree, but it doesn't mean you just have to antagonize by just lobbing things without at least listening. There's not some problems with a disgruntled family, but still it's a family if you're listening. Well, I, I felt like both of your Senate races were such missed opportunities where the, the first time I want to say, it seems like the Democrats piled in behind Arlen Specter and everyone called you saying, hey, get out of Arlen's way there. Apparently they offered you a job so you could get out of Arlen's way. And you were like, no, no, I'm, I'm going to do this. And you beat Arlen Specter in the primary. And, you know, at that point, too, I thought, OK, like everyone should freaking pile in behind Joe because clearly he is a better uh, he's a better candidate, like uh, more connected to folks. And you lose very narrowly to Pat Toomey. Um, and this is 2010, I believe. Uh, and then you come back again after losing narrowly. And it's like the Democrats didn't learn their lesson and they backed someone else against you again, I think. Is, that, <laughs> is, yeah. is this all correct? Yeah, uh, there was, for whatever reason, you would think, you know, people think the military, it's yes, sir, no, sir. Oh, it's anything but... You lose that trust of your sailors. I mean, things cannot work as well as you might like them to. And so I think there was found the same thing in the Democratic Senate leadership. Uh, You know, I was asked to come down and meet with them. They told me who I would hire, who I would fire, literally. And they were nice about it, but says, here's what we want to do. Hire this Washington firm. I didn't want a Washington firm. (laughs) (laughs) Anything. You know, and then finally, it was that final phone call. And as the senator said on it about the fundraise and said, fine, this is a very interesting conversation and hung up. I really felt that the dynamics of politics had changed. It wasn't any longer just about blasting money out there. And, you know, if you remember, Trump didn't put a hell of a lot of money into that race of his compared to others in the beginning. People found a false prophet in my opinion. But they just wanted to know. And the media I was getting was fantastic. And it wasn't the end all and be all. And sure, I could have said yes and returned. But I really felt strongly that if you just 
rent your soul for a while, <laughs> your principal for a while, that when you get down there, they will think they own it. And I, when I did a walk, I said, I'm an independent who happens to be a Democrat because I was an independent in the Navy. I got out to run on, as a Democrat because they had the very best approach to health care. As I told everybody, in the military, everybody has health care. Men and women get the same exact pay. You get a pension when you're done. And as I told you in the Tom Cruise question you gave me, you get training for a lifetime. So then you have another career prepared for out there. And then I'd pause and I'd say, everybody in the military is a Democrat. They just don't realize it. Wow, that's I was an independent because I took away from the Navy accountability. And Andrew, if I could just tell you one story. Please. On that aircraft carrier that you asked about at the very beginning with Tom Cruise, as he's sitting in that plane waiting to take off, every so often the plane's cap is to, the captain of the plane, you know, the pilot is told, shut down the plane. Something's wrong in the indicators, or else we need a different plane over Afghanistan, not an F 14, an EA 6B. But that captain has turned on his engines with his brakes on, and then they strap you into a catapult. That when he releases the brake and they push the button, it slingshots you into the air. But now you're sitting there rocking back and forth like that in that, in that thing. And you're rocking. <laughs> I mean, you take off. Walt Disney has no better ride than that. And then they tell you to shut it down. And that pilot is, doesn't want to shut his or her brakes down, uh, engines off, until they know they've been unhooked from that catapult. Because if they sh you shut your engine down, somebody by mistake pushes the button, off you go for your last wild ride. Yeah. So a young youth, probably average age, as I said, 19 and a half comes under that plane and unhooks it from the catapult where the pilot can't see under the belly of the plane, walks in front of the plane, gives a very simple signal like this, Andrew. And then that youth of America, could be from California, could be from Utah, doesn't move until the pilot has shut down their plane, open up the cockpit and gotten safely on deck. And that youth has said everything that this nation yearns for, what it most wants. He said, or she said that youth, go ahead, you can trust me because I'm willing to be accountable, not for my intentions, but for the deed. And if I made a mistake and you start heading overboard to your death, I'm going right there with you to mine. I can't find a lot of Americans who feel that any very many people in Washington, D.C. would ever stand in front of that plane for them. That accountability is the second thing I took away from service. Above party, above everything but nation. And I really believe that's what this nation really wants. And why, frankly, I joined the Ford Party. Well, thank you so much, Joe. We do have to rekindle that sense of trust uh, and belonging and community in millions of Americans. And certainly having a 20-year-old stand in front of the plane saying, look, I've unhooked this. And if I haven't, then we're both going to die. <laughs> you know, like there's, there's, there's nothing uh, more more uh, inspiring than that because you know you've placed your life in the hands of someone. Um, and people in service have had to do that over and over again, you know, for, for years. Uh, it, it is that kind of spirit that the country needs. And I'm so grateful to you for believing in forward as a way to hopefully accomplish that. Do you think that, uh, and this is something that I, I've actually gone um, somewhat deep on. Do you think that some kind of mandatory national service might help instill uh, a, a sense of community uh, or belonging or trust? Because uh, you've probably seen some of the proposals in that direction. Yes, I do. Um, in the book I published called Walking in Your Shoes is a chapter on national service. Whenever military men and women come together, they always ask, where did you serve? Or if you see somebody's ribbons, you can often tell where they serve. But if you're a vet, you always say, first question. And I was at a VFW the other day doing an event for a young man who was running and where did you serve? Imagine if someone said that all Americans come together and said, where'd you do your national service? Not just the military. Wow. Because 
people, it takes about often a year of training before they send you out to that nuclear reactor. Remember, 19 and a half years old, average age, they run a nuclear reactor. You want to make things sailor proof by being well trained. And so maybe it's a year Peace Corps. Maybe it's a year um, uh, teaching in America. Maybe it's a year whatever. Yes. Do I think that could help instill once again, the community bonding that has somewhat disappeared? And, And then I also believe this, though that I also took away if you happen to do something overseas. You mentioned that I established a uh, nonprofit, First Global. It brought together uh, within nine months a constitutional hall across from the White House, 158 nations, as you well know, a high school teams, 60% of whom had never had a STEM core course, had never touched a robot, but it was the first high school a robotic Olympics. And we put together 800 Americans in, a, an internet, in an internet Peace Corps. And they would go over to the Congo, where you read they're having challenge today, or Mali, where I still stay, stay in touch with. And they would train them of how, after we shipped them the robot, to put it together to compete the best way it might. Then when they came here to America, there was three teams on each side. And, and the thing was, I did is I, I it wasn't just for the vacation and try to show the leaders this got to get everywhere STEM. But I learned in the military when I arrived off Afghanistan with a battle group with my 12 ships, including the carrier, there was 22 other ships waiting there for us. Another Armada, Japan that had not been outside the Sea of Japan since my father fought them in World War II. Germany was there and the Italians they were coming a little late, but they sent a message that said, we will be there because America has been attacked and we will be there for them. I learned that America's greatest power, and I think this could come from your question of having a National Service Corps, is you also learn that our greatest power is the power to convene, to bring others together for a common cause that serves us all. I don't care if it's uh, climate change, I don't care if it's the Ukraine situation today, learning that in a community of those who are doing national service, particularly overseas like Peace Corps and all, bodes a long way. But right here in America, doing it with Americans together from California to Arkansas would also bring that same sets together. We have more in common than in differences. I'm sure people listening to you right now are thinking to themselves, holy cow, like this guy would make a great president, which, by the way, I do think you'd make a, a, a great president. Um, you and I spent some spent some time together on the trail in 2020, and I was blown away by how you didn't seem to get a fair shake. Uh, and and there's been something of a pattern, honestly, where I, I feel like for whatever reason, the Democrats don't seem to know what they have in you or had in you um, in terms of the U.S. Senate race in Pennsylvania. I think you should have been a U.S. senator. And then I think you should have been the president, honestly, like that. that's the way I see it. Uh, And when you and I were on the trail together, um, you walked across the state of New Hampshire, kind of, uh, again, reflecting um, a bit of a pattern for for you, which is just trying to meet people and put yourself in their shoes and come across as a human being, which is kind of the opposite of the the approach to politics that that most people have. It's just you working hard um, to meet people where they are. And I thought that uh, I mean, I was, you know, in New Hampshire, not the same way you were when you walked across the state. Um, how long did that take, by the way? That was a lot shorter. <laughs> so, <laughs> about seven, about, I think it was 11 days, but I have a nor'easter that came across one time. And, uh, you know, and I passed this street called Hell Street in the middle of it. And uh, I, I, as I remember, I put it up there, it says, I think this nor'easter must be one from hell. <laughs> but I knew it. <laughs> If I could, Andrew, that walk was meaningful. I uh, Because I would stop at a place every day to make a point. So one of the places I would, went to was uh, where they were learning um, how to do, work with, you know, artisans that were actually there that had, were working in plumbing and how to learn about the new plumbing tools and alliances, get, getting reeducated. You know, I'm a strong believer that's in my book that said we need training for a lifetime because we put less into training and retraining our blue collar workers, our enlisted men and women 
that at, at General Locke may have said they're your greatest strength and they are still our greatest strength today in the civilian world than any other OECD developed nation. So I can understand why they sometimes sit, sit there and, and think of the song by Pink called What About Us? When they see all of a sudden college scholarships, but they want to know about us. Why isn't this a win-win where those tractors you saw out there in Iowa, as I talked to one person running back and forth in a parade, said, hey, can you tell me, um, what do you do? And she said, I'm a video, a digital agronomist, and I am going to uh, make sure we don't need drivers of those tractors. Well, where's the program that really does say, what about us? And that's what I mean by walking in other shoes. One other example, if you don't mind. Please. H Veterans Day, even after I left Congress into the pandemic, because I didn't want them to think I'd forgotten them, to a penitentiary. Uh, Gradyford Penitentiary was one oft I often went for, and I did the same in New Hampshire up there. When I went to the one in New Hampshire, I learned uh, that this was one where they walk you in as a prisoner, and just like you're walking into a dental office, <laughs> they got two K two. Uh, uh, bar uh, rooms here with bars, and then you could sit down there in a chair. And if you behave, they're going to treat you as a respectful human being. And that's how the whole place was run. I just walked all through that maximum security prison. And I also did this and learned a lot about de-escalation, which, as you well know, as watching many videos recently, we have to understand as tough as it is, that is the right approach and when you have something beginning untoward in violence, perhaps, rather than thinking you must take care of it in a very aggressive way. And I learned that lesson there in that prison. But I also learned that these, when I went to the vets there in Graterford, I was out there in with you and I got a call, if you don't mind. <laughs> and uh, it was Graterford Prison on, on the line. And an inmate uh, got on the line and said, because I used to go there each year and said, and he goes, Hey, Joe, the guys have heard that you're running for president. They want you to know they're going to organize Philadelphia for you. Oh, wow. I mean, what presidential candidate has that cocktail story, huh? Oh. <laughs> but anyway, my point was, <laughs> then, service. Veterans never forget it. Back to your original point about bringing people together for national service. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'm reaching a little bit here. But when you look at the recidivism programs, the lack thereof, and we have to keep in mind it was President Bush, who was the only president in America who ever mentioned recidivism in a State of the Union message and then put three and a half million, uh, $350 million into that program. And yet we still have about an 85% or so recidivism rate in many of our programs. I bring all this up is you need to put yourself in other people's shoes and go there to really understand why they view things the way they do and try to correct the view if it's wrong. But if not, see if you can work together. You mentioned your daughter uh, earlier. She uh, unfortunately uh, had major health problems when she was young that she recovered from, uh, but then they recurred uh, around the same time that you were looking at uh, running for president. And I'm sure that must have been uh, extraordinarily painful and difficult. It, it, yes, Um She's a warrior. Um, I, um, I, there's, there's no one like her ever met. And it did come back. And so everything's off the table. And we just worked it through. And the doctor said after six, eight months, whatever, I, I think we've got it back in remission again. I had gotten in that first race in Congress, as I told you, as a payback tour to my country. Because we were in a hospital room after they first said they couldn't get it at a military hospital. And she had four to maybe six or so months, but they couldn't get it out the resection. And it was glioblastoma. We went to Children's Hospital because my health care plan permitted me in the military to do that. And they saved her life. For, for quite a period of time till it came back the second time. And I had to pay back my country. That's why I ran on healthcare. This time, I thought we were okay. And again, then I got into the presidential race. Uh, 
but as you probably know, uh, you do know, is uh, simultaneously it was time to say uh, it's unfair to ask people to continue to support me. It was also uh, it just been when uh, the cancer had uh, reoccurred a third time. So, and all. But it's uh, the greatest thing in life was to have her. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry, Joe. I mean, as as a parent myself, I can only imagine what what that must have been. But as you said, I mean, uh, I'm sure uh, she was the greatest gift uh, uh, for both you and your your wife uh, while she was with us. She was wise. Um, I remember once she was about eight years old, and um, I said to her, "Hey, hon, how how am I doing raising you?" She leaned over and touched my shoulder with her small hand and said, Oh, daddy, 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 I'm raising you. (laughs) Every day I changed because of her and grew up. And I I didn't realize that the extent of what your family was uh, dealing with when we were on the trail. Um, I do think that you didn't get a, a fair shake or a real look on why we were running. And one of the stories that uh, I ran across was that major news networks wouldn't have you on um, even to talk about foreign policy, which, by the way, you are about a million times more qualified than <laughs> just about <laughs> anyone, anyone else, given um, your vast global um, military leadership uh, and travel and experience. So my fans sometimes got agitated where they're like, hey, Yang's not getting a, a, a fair look, um, which I appreciated. Thank you, Yang Yang. But it was, but like I, I felt like there were other candidates who were in the same boat. And I'd say that you were very much the top of that list. Um, was there ever a point when you were like, hey, guys, three-star admiral, 10 medals, two-term member of Congress from a swing state, like, you know, you might want to give me a microphone or put a point a camera this way. <laughs> like, did, 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 did you ever have that feeling? Of course. Uh, we even had a memo from one of the uh, lead, uh, you, you know, the CNN, MSNBC and Fox. And from one of them, we had a, a friend on the station sent me a copy of the memo saying not to have Joe Sestak on. And the other one had a good friend, but he just said, ain't going to happen. Uh, but, you know, I think I kind of learned that, Complain about the media for a politician is like a sea captain complaining about the sea. And you just got to accept it. I do think that it's a challenge at times, yes, for me, but it also has, I think, at times, you know, hurt the nation a little bit in other circumstances. As the head, former head, I think it was of CBS said, you know, um, Mr. Trump is great for our ratings, you know, and how could they miss who and what he was going to bring or even the win the first time. But if you were out there on the deck plates, not just in a studio, I can remember after they put over about just about $10 million, the Democratic Party did via unions, even though my union voting record was like 100%, and, uh, and also direct from the DS, uh, Democratic Central Campaign Committee into my, for my opponent, because we were like 24 points up with three or four weeks to go, and then all the money came in on an ad that the Washington Post gave four Pinocchios to as being false, and called a sleazy way to win. I couldn't complain it was over, and okay, but I, uh, I can... It's like they didn't, I was out there after that was over and went back as I did the first time to every one of the 67 counties to say thank you. I also, because a Philadelphia congressional boss and a Pittsburgh congressional boss wouldn't let me go to any other Democratic events. So I went to like 200 African American churches and went back to thank them individually too. But the first county I went back to, Scranton County, uh, all, they came together, you know, and I thanked them for their support. And I remember this one woman stood up who was vice chair of something at the time and said, I just want you to know that I have relatives of mine who have voted Democrat this entire life period of theirs, but they're going to go for Trump. And I knew she was talking about her. 
And right then I said, no, if I'm getting this down on the death plates, it means somebody better be alert, aware that this is not, you know, just a joke happening of, of, you know, but again, I step back to what you also said. He was a symptom of a problem. And I do believe that problem was why couldn't we earn their trust? And when you're doing things from Washington, D.C., even the media, and constantly lobbying artillery shells, of, as I said, of these culture issues back and forth, and never listening, very rarely saying there's a dialogue because you think you'll get primaried out. You're not willing to, you're willing for the expedient to lose your principle. I think that that is what has been most damaging and caused it. Oh, you're, you're such a generous spirit about it, Joe, because uh, what you just referred to, I believe, was they piled a bunch of money into your primary opponent, uh, Katie McGinty, uh, during the your intended rematch um, in 2016 against Pat Toomey. And then McGinty would go on to lose pretty handily, I, I, I think. Um, and I think you would have won that race. The whole thing just struck me as so bizarre. <laughs> where like, like you were clearly the uh, the candidate with the broadest crossover appeal. You'd won your district, which was like a, like either a swing or a slightly Republican district by 20 points. Uh, you know, you'd lost narrowly against the, the incumbent senator despite not having Democratic support. And then instead of learning their lesson being like, okay, this time we should just back Joe Sestak and, you know, win this thing, they decide to for whatever reason, like pile money behind your, your primary opponent who then goes on to lose. So the, like the, the whole thing, like, like if I'm you, I mean, heck I'm angry on your behalf and I'm not even you. Um, but, uh, you know, like the, uh, and the fact that you kind of saw some of the uh, loss of trust manifesting in people moving to Trump before anyone else. I mean, that makes sense to me because you were actually close to the ground talking to people. Perhaps you could say a silver lining around it was, I think, the DSCC perhaps learned by burning its hand that trying to be an authoritarian circle down there and think you know what's best for each state, because Pennsylvania is different than New York. Uh, a lot of commonality of values, but the culture is, you know, it's a little different than down in Manhattan. Wonderfully different, you know? And, and I think that when you look, I think it's one out of every four. I could has some fa Pennsylvania has some family member who has served. Wow! It's, it's no wonder they love you there, Joe. I mean, <laughs> you have to look that number up, but it's a lot. You know, it's interesting when we were out there in Iowa together. Of course, I got out there late because I I wasn't going to in unless my daughter was on the road to that recovery and 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 made sure that we had three m months of MRIs that said not there. And I got in and when I arrived, everybody had their volunteers because I was like the last aboard the caboose. So I went to a homeless shelter for vets and said, hey, can I give you guys a dollar above minimum wage and you'll pass out brochures because I love to do, you know, love to run in parades. And as you remember out there, parades, I mean, if a farmer has a grows more strawberries than last year, they throw a parade. <laughs> and I remember I called one woman up and said, how many people do you think is going to be there? So we don't have brochures. And I said, well probably more than normal. We haven't had a parade in about four weeks. So I always got everywhere and ran these parades and I had the, these wonderful veterans uh, from the homeless shelter passing my brochure out, the very first parade. And I would run back and forth and shake every hair and learn that in my congressional district. I did it all the time because the, you know, 87% of all elected officials were Republicans and the county ones would drive in a car down the middle of it. And I'm running back and forth, shaking everybody's hand. But I had a picture of me uh, shaking President Clinton's hand in the old office as he was in uniform or briefing him on something. And I would say every 10th person there. And this, I can remember that first spray was in a, it wasn't in a Des Moines. <laughs> it was out there in the rurals. And uh, every 10th person would stand up as I approached him and said, I want to thank you for your service as he hands it. And everyone I went down the path and shook almost invariably, one out of three of those with thanks for your service. And yeah, I, I think it is. And here's why. I think that people in the rural areas, and so many of them come, came into our military, but that was it. They feel they've served our nation by giving them energy over the decades.
they feel they've served our nation by giving them agriculture over the decades and that they served our nation in every war, uh, even heavily in war. And now all of a sudden their livelihoods are at risk, whether it's tractors or coal mines or whatever. And all of a sudden they're saying, wait a minute, what's happening? And who's out here trying to help me? When I got out there, I heard there was a former uh, vice superintendent or something from Newark out there in, in, in Iowa. So I gave him a call and he was Republican, somebody had told me. And I said, what's it like out here? And he'd gone out there for his final tour as a, and had, was police chief of kind of a rural semi-urban area, but lots of rural. How's the crime rate out here? Because this Iowa niceness is pretty awesome. You saw it, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it too. It, it's real. And uh, he said, it's not the robberies, it's not the murders. What it is, is people who've lost their jobs, they're on opioids now, all of a sudden there's domestic abuse, all of a sudden there's petty theft, and there's nowhere, you know, the I am their service uh, networks, uh, service network, social network. He says, that's what it is. And you found, you know, I looked into it and uh, all but four of those counties, two were stable in population, two were growing and the rest were decreasing. Yep. Four private hospitals had closed before the three or four years yep. we got there. So it's tough and we've got to look at it from their angle. Yeah, I, I was in rural communities in Iowa where schools were closing or consolidating. They were combining two schools into one or uh, in like closing schools. I mean, if you're in that kind of environment and then all of a sudden your kid has to, you know, go to the next town over because your local school closed. I mean, you know, that like you're, you're going to be uh, receptive to, you know, like a, a, a different message and you're going to feel like, Hey, like who the heck is looking out for us? Because um, yeah, things are, are trending negatively um, for the people in their lives uh, there were uh, folks I spoke to too who who were you know like struggling with their family members were struggling with opiate addiction, um, uh, which isn't something I think people associate necessarily with uh, places like rural Iowa, but uh, but it was there. Yeah, and Andrew, I mean, I know you feel like me because we've talked about it before. What an experience! It was priceless, no matter how it came out to have seen what we saw and all of America. And, and one more thing about those opioids. You know, I can remember reading an article, uh, now it's Purdue and everybody is being taken to court about uh, all the um, illicit use of these op opioids that were being pushed by prescriptions and other things and people keeping a blind eye to it in the pharmaceutical industry, which I'm very grateful for. They saved our daughter's life for a couple of times. I'm very, I mean, you know, she wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, it wouldn't have been here as long as we wanted it wasn't for them. That said, we knew in another previous to Trump that, you know, and the Washington Post did a wonderful expose on it. And a book just came out about two months ago about it, that because of these pill mills in West Virginia, for example, the rural areas, something like a million pills being shipped there either every day or every month for a town of 2000. Yeah. And, and we, DIA won't investigate it, but they were shut down first administratively and second by a uh, law passed by Congress to, in a polite, delicate way, so to speak, that it wasn't so obvious. And that to me is this accountability issue. Um, and, you know, we've had over 500 and I don't, you know, don't mind it, but we've had too many over 502 decades, people leave public service elected and go off to become lobbyists and all one of whom went off to become in the justice department, helped close that down, went to become a lobbyist for one of the pharmaceuticals. I bring this up because what I meant, I meant that is what about me when they felt they've already as in their heritage is given so much to this nation. And yes, we do need to make sure that as we do change what are true discriminations and other things, that it's a win-win yeah. rather than a win and an apparent feeling of loss here. Yeah. I, I also have extraordinarily positive feelings and memories uh, from the time in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, and you, you get the sense that the people of this country uh, are good. 
uh, and want a lot of the same things. Um, and they're being failed, in my opinion, by a system that's not actually delivering what they want. Um, and also is pitting us against each other, as you say, like, you know, on one side or another, just bombing uh, artillery shells at each other, um, uh, rather than solving the problems that people are experiencing in Iowa or New Hampshire or New York City or California. Um, so thrilled to be working with you on forward, and hopefully we can do something to help provide a, a positive uh alternative to the tit for tat uh, character dramas uh, of the day. And I know that you're intent on trying to rebuild the nation's trust. Thrilled that you're going to be joining me and uh, I'm sure hundreds of other people in Houston on September 24th. So that's going to be in incredible. But what are your hopes for forward? What can we do to actually reinvigorate the sense of community and trust that people have lost? Yes. I think first and foremost, we should keep in mind what James Madison said. Yeah, we know what he talked about, the dangers of factionalism. But at the end of his writings, he said, the circulation of confidence, of trust, is more important than the circulation of money. And his explanation was, if we ever lose trust in public institutions or with each other, then we're lost. And I think if we keep that in mind, that it isn't just about winning first, because how can you then govern that if we are out there listening and explaining? And I do think that as we go down this road, I was very happy, just like Abraham Lincoln and others joined a new party back in the 1850s, the Republican Party, the one third party that definitely grew up to be significant that they did it for one issue at the time, no extension of slavery into the Western territories. And he kept a house from dividing. With that as our model, and the motto, uh, motto, model, and the motto is Jay Madison, I think that we can then slowly, having listened, make sure we work on what I call pragmatic issues. That's how the Navy does it. We give health care to everybody, not because we're liberal. Two thirds of military members are Republicans. That's why I fell at home in my Republican district, two to one. You know, two to one. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, you know, and and yet it's practical. In the first U.S. Congress held in New York, because they mandated all sailors on our merchant ships had to have health care, because they didn't want scurvy to destroy our economy, and they had to pay part of it. They didn't want, to, so as we had to bring our raw materials to England to be made into furniture and other items and brought back. And without a healthy fleet, we would not have a strong economy. Our tea, original Tea Party forefathers understood that, as I told the yes, today's Tea Party people back in 2010 when it was happening. We need to show pragmatically why things work, not as an ideology, not yeah. as a culture, but yeah. pragmatically. And so why don't we have training for a lifetime when in the military, what a waste it would be if Tom Cruise didn't have the mechanic that was on the F-14 trained to be ready for the JSF. And so I think slowly but surely we can, if we listen, I have hopes that the Ford Party then letting everyone know that they want to make sure that we really do believe the biggest issue of trust from Americans. So let me have to vote for us if there anything, but yeah, I got yeah. it. OK. Second, laying out those issues that are pragmatic that America needs. Otherwise, yeah, we've got something done through the Congress recently. But will the next Congress rip it out or what? And we can't yeah. afford to do that. If I could, though, I also believe on foreign policy. We need to understand that today we just like that war in Afghanistan where I had 22 ships from other nations with us, that we are all stronger with U.S. leadership, but who can't do it alone, whether it's against authoritarianism like China or Russia, or whether it's against climate change. Uh, we need to be able to have people who can help lead this world and explain to Americans why their own economy, their own jobs are going to be better and protected if we are working with the proper programs jointly. 
whether it's Africa, which will soon have the largest middle class in about 30 years in, in the world, and they're going to want air conditioning. They're going to want all that stuff. Do they get the right type of climate change efficient one? So I'll stop with that. But I have great hopes for this because I don't think we've had a more decisive moment with a possible than the Civil War, with the possible exception of the Huey Long, Father Coughlin area under FDR. Trust, unity, pragmatism. You would have made a great president, my friend. And who knows? Navy Admiral patriot, really like a, a true American hero, Joe Sestak. And Joe, like, I'm just so grateful to you for your friendship, um, for your belief and your continued optimism about what we can do for this country. It, it, it's really a, a uplifting and inspiring. So thank you. And thank you, Andrew. I so enjoyed you during the campaign. I so enjoyed that you're the first to reach out afterwards and kept contact afterwards. I truly hope that your service, public service, to a leadership role does go on 40 years. And finally, thanks for having me aboard. <laughs> hey, man, man, thank you for joining. Freaking A, man. We'll put you up in the admiral seat. <laughs> thanks, Andrew, very much. <laughs>